So when people think of addiction, they think of alcoholism, heroin addiction, crack, cocaine, but you have a much broader understanding of addiction. Yes, it was shown to me. It's that, I think it's the relationship between the inner and outer worlds, and those most obvious things, like of heroin, alcoholism, substance misuse, they are merely the most ev evident form of addiction. I think it's an attachment a belief that the material and external world can somehow resolve the problems of your inner life. Put more simply, addiction is a behaviour that you would like to stop and when you can't, when you try to, you cannot. Addiction begins with pain and it ends with pain. You are in pain, you practice whatever it is you do to get you away from the pain, whether it's pornography or food or sex or drugs, and then it leads to more pain and then the cycle begins again. So. The, I am increasingly, as I am taught more about the nature of addiction, less and less interested in the object. It's almost better to be a crackhead because if you are a crackhead, it's pretty clear what the problem is because you're taking crack. So it's a good entry point into the conversa conversation. If someone's taking crack and they go, I don't know what the problem is, could it be the crack? <laughs> no! Or if someone's you know, it's like, so, but if it's someone, codependency, toxic relationships, work, you know, it's, you can, they'll deny it all the live long day. Think about it, I found myself in context where various forms of my addictive behaviour were lionised. You know, I go, like if you're a 20 year old at a drama school in London and you are a heroin addict and you drink, that's an advantage. People think, oh my God, this guy, he's crazy. Something. Yeah, until it's not, until it's like, yeah, all right, there's a lot of sick everywhere and he's breaking all the windows. Yeah, or well, there's this subtle, insidious form of addiction, like perhaps looking at myself in the mirror, just wanting to be liked all the time. Oh, boy, that's exhausting. Yeah, but it's a good, isn't it? Because it's a signal that there's something in you that wants to be fed and nurtured. And the good news about the 12 steps, and it's, that sounds kind of Christian, the good news is the answers are coming. <laughs> the Lord is present. He is within. The resurrection will happen, and it won't be over there. It will be in here. It will rise again. I want to talk a little bit about yoga and this kind of spiritual and embodied practices because the 12 step was obviously very, very influential for you from a spiritual perspective. But I wonder what the relationship is between the 12 step and yoga and a little bit about the importance of yoga in your personal healing journey. Step 11 of the 12 steps is increase conscious contact with God of our understanding. The point of yoga is to prepare the body, you know, I'm talking about uh, um, asana yoga, prepare the body for meditative states. So there's an obvious corollary there around step 11. My personal experience is I started doing yoga when I was in treatment to get off drugs the first time, like not at a place, the place I got clean wasn't that, I'm proud to say, fancy. But like I started doing the yoga classes outside and like, so it took over. My mum always said, you should be doing yoga. I got like sort of dark memories of people always telling me the answer was gonna be meditation for me and spirituality, but I plowed on with that heroin and crack and other people's approval and all that stuff. So yoga, why I like yoga is because it's an embodied physical practice and this, the body is part of it. And increasingly, I think that the line between consciousness, the body, the spirit and the mind is an imaginary one. I mean, I can't find an exact point where neurology is distinct from the nervous system. You know, I don't know where that line is. I don't think there is a line. So part of my deal is yoga. Part of my deal is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, but the only things that I would sort of with confidently pass on and inculcate is 12 steps. That's the only thing, because that's the only thing that I've 100% sort of has like it works for me. But like I feel that there's as many versions of recovery as there are addicts and I think we're all addicts to some degree. And I think these 12 steps, they're like Shakespeare. They can handle interpretation. They can handle people going, well, I'm a Buddhist and I want to do it this way. Well, I'm an atheist, I want to do it this way. We're radical feminists, we want to do it this way. We're, we're, like, whatever it is you want to do, this can handle you. That's why I like it. You talked about your first mentor, I believe his name was Chip Summers. Yes, Chip. Um, and I found it actually really, really interesting how you described sort of the ideal conditions for, me for mentorship to thrive. Like what are those ideal conditions um, for mentorship to be successful? I would have to say that the ideal conditions for mentorship to thrive is surrender and acceptance and honesty, open-mindedness and willingness. These are the ideal conditions. 
when I'm dealing with people with addiction issues, in a sense, it becomes a relief once you're in the program, once you're on the other side, because I go, oh, you're a heroin addict, are you? Well, here are the things you need to do. I don't want to do that. Okay. So what about you? Have you got a problem? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because like, this is not me. This is not my idea. This is, uh, you know, relatively new for a theology that's going to become as influential as I believe it's going to become. It's, you know, 70, 80 years old. It's derived, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, from the theology of William James, the psychiatry of Carl Jung, first century Christianity, as espoused by like Emmett Fox. And there are some linguistic and, uh, I would say, nomenclature problems as a result of that. I'm interested in the altering of the vocabulary so it becomes more appropriate and accessible. I'm not about demystification, but remystification. Mm. God is present in this. There's nothing without God in this, but it's a heavily heavily cargoed word right. these sure. days.